This video is supported by CuriosityStream. So you want to go to Mars, do you? Want to be the Neil Armstrong of the Red Planet? Want to have schools named after you? Want to be a trivia question in bars for decades? Well, congratulations, and thank you. The world needs more people like you. And by that I mean absolute lunatics with a total disregard for their own life. Going to Mars is hard. And look, I get the frustration that we haven't been to Mars yet. I was born on the heels of Apollo, and I grew up totally believing that we would be going to Mars at some point in my lifetime. Now look how gray this beard is. I mean, come on, people. Get a move on. But no, seriously, the moon is 250,000 miles away. Mars is 34 million miles away at its absolute closest point. That's 136 times further. And as P. Diddy once said, mo miles, mo problems. He did say miles, didn't he? It was about space travel, that song. No? There are, of course, plans in the works, with SpaceX suggesting they could get there in their Starship vehicle by 2024. Meanwhile, NASA's focusing on the moon with the Artemis program to try to establish a moon base there, and then using that as a way station to Mars sometime in the 2030s. But why, you may be asking, go there at all? Why would you ask that? What's wrong with you? You could pin it on our natural human need to explore. You could say that we're running out of space and resources here and we need to set something up somewhere else. You could say that until we become a multiplanetary species, we will always be in danger of extinction and we absolutely will go extinct when the sun goes red giant. All these arguments have been made. But here's the thing about Mars and every other planet in the universe for that matter. It's not Earth. Earth is the egg inside which we were formed. We evolved here over billions of years to be perfectly adapted to this one planet and its infinitely specific conditions. Everything else in the universe wants to kill us. Seriously though, go outside. Point up at the sky. You can go like eight kilometers that direction. Everything beyond that for 93 billion light years until you reach the very end of space and time will kill you. So about a year ago, I did a video where I talked about why going to Mars would be a terrible idea, and it was uh, <laughs> well received. So since there might be a few people living in a cave somewhere that I didn't manage to piss off with that video, I thought, let's just dive deeper into that and ask the question, seriously, could you even survive a trip to Mars? Like seriously, what kind of toll would this take on the human body? Is it something that you could even survive? And if you do, what kind of long lasting effects would it have? So to start things off, let's just get clear about the scale of what we're talking about here. Now, anybody who follows this channel, I'm sure you already know this, but let's just lay the groundwork here for just what an endeavor this is. Getting to Mars isn't like hopping over to the moon in a few days. Mars and Earth run different elliptical paths around the sun, with the Mars year taking almost a full two Earth years. So a large part of that time, it's on the other side of the sun from us. We can only launch to Mars in specified launch windows, which only occur every 26 months. And because the distance is so long and the fuel is so heavy, we have to take the most energy efficient route, which is known as the Hohmann transfer. This uses the orbital velocity of the ship around Earth as well as the velocity of Earth's orbit to coast up to Mars orbit, which takes around nine months. By the time you land on Mars, Earth will be on the other side of the sun from where you started. Once at Mars, there's a return window you have to meet in order to come back to Earth, which is just three to four months before you spend another nine months traveling back. All in all, a full trip to Mars and back, the shortest possible trip with current technology is at least a 21 month mission. Just for perspective, the record for the longest continuous space flight by any human being in history was 14 months, set by Valery Porykov in 1995. Yes, the shortest possible trip to Mars is a full seven months longer than the longest time any human being has ever been in space. Now before anybody splits hairs and says that the time that you spend on Mars doesn't count because you're not in space, wrong, wrong. Look, take off your spacesuit in space, you die. Take off your spacesuit on Mars, you die. Don't fool yourself. Being on Mars is being in space, just with ground. And for anybody who wants to further split hairs, yes, there are people out there who have spent more time in space collectively over the course of their careers than a trip to Mars would accrue, but not very many. Only 10 astronauts and cosmonauts, mostly cosmonauts, has spent more time in space than one trip to Mars would take. And that time in space did a number on their bodies. First of all, your head swells in space. On Earth, gravity is constantly pulling your blood down towards your feet. So we have evolved to push blood up into our head. So when you're in zero G, you just have this constant overpressurization of blood rushing to your head. Scott Kelly once said that being in space constantly feels like you've just been hanging upside down for a few minutes. There's just this constant rush of blood. 
And it's not just uncomfortable and, well, weird looking. It can also lead to sinus pressure, which can be painful and lead to breathing problems. But perhaps the side effect that bothers NASA scientists the most in terms of the pressure in the head is that it distorts your vision. Astronauts have suggested since the 1970s that being in space altered their vision in some way, but it's only in the last recent few years that NASA really looked into it. And it turns out that, yeah, all of that swelling up into your head can actually cause your eyeballs to squish a little bit and make you become a little bit more farsighted in the best case scenarios can actually cause retinal damage in worst case scenarios. And for reasons that have not been fully explained yet, it happens more often to men than women, and more often in the right eye than the left eye. Even more distressing is that some studies have shown that the immune system actually becomes weaker when you're in weightlessness, and on top of that, bacteria actually become more virulent when they're weightless. Meaning the longer you're in space, the more vulnerable you are to disease. And astronauts are also subjected to higher levels of CO2, when they're in weightless conditions, because even though there are CO2 filters, say, in the space station, when they exhale, because of zero gravity, it just kind of pools around your head. And increased inhalation of CO2 can lead to cognitive effects, like a decline in decision-making and problem-solving. But the biggest bugaboo is bone loss, which is something that space agencies have been aware of for quite some time now. Our connection with the ground, every single time we take a step, that sends a signal through our bodies to put calcium into our bones to strengthen and rebuild them. Even just sitting upright in normal gravity causes your muscles to kind of tighten around your bones and applies a little bit of force there. Without any of that in space, your body stops reinforcing your bones and it starts filtering your calcium through your kidneys, which can lead to kidney stones, which are fun. Also, astronauts who have been in space for longer than six months usually show heightened levels of homocysteine, which can be a marker for cardiovascular disease. Now, most of these up to this point, there are solutions for. Fans can blow the CO2 around, glasses can correct for vision, supplements can deal with the calcium situation, and of course, regular exercise can prevent bone loss. But perhaps the biggest one is radiation exposure. Astronauts on the ISS receive 10 times the normal amount of radiation and they're inside the Earth's magnetic shield. Passengers on a trip to Mars would be exposed to much greater radiation for a much longer period of time, and that's not just solar radiation, but also cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are much higher energy particles, usually protons and neutrons, that can do a lot more damage to DNA. And it's a lot harder to shield from than solar wind. And scientists at the Brookhaven National Laboratory have done experiments with mice where they bombard them with something akin to cosmic rays to see how it affects them, and they found that their ability to go through a maze went down significantly, meaning that the cosmic rays may be damaging their brain tissue. The speculation is that it's also damaging other organs, like their digestive system and their heart and their lungs and that kind of thing. And astronauts are going to be exposed to that for nine months just to get to Mars. Now might be a good time to kind of address the elephant in the room for some of you out there, I'm sure, who are already thinking this, and, and it's that, that, uh, that duration of the flight to Mars, um, well, it's not set in stone. Mars and Earth have elliptical orbits, so even when you get one of those transfer windows, it's a little bit different every time. Every trip to Mars is a little bit different. The SpaceX plan to get to Mars, for example, has a refueling uh, in orbit, which actually might give them a little bit more fuel that they can burn, give them more velocity, might get them there a little bit quicker. Uh, some of them are saying six months for that. Extremely optimistic people say three months. And there are other theoretical propulsion systems like nuclear thermal propulsion that says that they could possibly get us there in 90 to 100 days, that's three to four months. And there's also the possibility of scaled up ion drives that um, don't have a whole lot of thrust to them, but they burn for a very long time and over, over time it actually can pick up incredible speeds. And there are also different return trajectories and different windows that people could take, which some say could put us on Mars for up to 18 months. Some say we, the stay there might be a lot shorter, but we might have to take a more indirect route, maybe using Venus as a, as a gravity assist. The point is, the shortest possible duration that I was able to find was 21 months. So I'm going with that, but it could be much, much longer. So let's just say everything goes perfectly. Nothing blows up. You don't hit a straight asteroid. You don't get taken by some gelatinous aliens on the way and you survive re-entry and you survive landing and you get to be on Mars. Then what? Well, when space station astronauts and cosmonauts come home from the ISS, this happens. They're usually so weak and discombobulated from their time in zero gravity that a whole landing crew assembles to physically carry them to ground transportation. And this is after only six months on the ISS. That ground crew is not going to be waiting for you on Mars. Most astronauts report a bit of a reacclimation period when they get back to Earth where their muscles and joints are kind of getting used to the gravity again. But beyond all that, 
there's a sensory motor cortex. As retired astronaut Leroy Chow once described about going weightless, your inner ear thinks you're tumbling. The balance system in there is going all over the place. Meanwhile, your eyes are telling you that you're not tumbling, you're upright. The two systems are sending all this contradictory information to your brain. This usually leads to a few days of nausea as people get used to the weightlessness. Well, once you've acclimated to the weightlessness, the same thing will happen to you again when you get on land. Astronaut Mark Kelly once described when he got back to land, he would turn his head and it felt like the whole world was flipping end over end. So here's your situation. You've landed on Mars after an extremely long duration space flight. Your muscles and joints are achy as they're trying to get back used to the gravity. Your eyes are readjusting back to where they used to be before you went up into space. You're cognitively declined from all the CO2 and cosmic rays that might have hit you. And on top of all that, every time you turn your head, the world does somersaults and you don't even have muscle memory to rely on because now you're in one third gravity. You're in a gravity situation that you've never been before in your entire life. And while you're in this state, you have to enter and operate and work in an environment where if you make one single mistake, it would not just kill you, it would kill everyone on the ship. Welcome to Mars. Mars is like living in Antarctica, except, you know, no air. Actually, Mars has air, but it only has about 1% the pressure of the air that we have here, and most of that is carbon dioxide, which we 100% can't breathe. And because the atmosphere is so thin, there's not much to retain the heat at night, so temperatures can go from an average high of 2 degrees Celsius in the summer to an average low of negative 76 degrees Celsius in the same day. It was thought that Mars used to have a thicker atmosphere, but it doesn't have a magnetic shield like we do here on Earth, so its atmosphere was picked away by solar wind, just one atom at a time, molecule by molecule over billions of years. And that same lack of a magnetic field and the thin atmosphere that that lack of a magnetic field caused means that there's almost no protection against solar radiation and cosmic rays. Meaning the first humans living on Mars are probably gonna live underground or at least be covered by ground to limit exposure to that radiation. Ground, that is toxic. In 2008, the Mars Phoenix lander discovered large amounts of perchlorates in the Martian soil. Perchlorate is a salt solution, which might be why some of the water that we've seen on the surface of Mars might still be in liquid form because it's turned it into sort of a brine. It's also a component of rocket fuel and munitions, and according to the EPA, perchloric acid is corrosive to the eye, skin, and respiratory tract, and short-term exposure to high doses may cause sore throat, coughing, labored breathing, deep burns, loss of vision, abdominal pain, vomiting, or diarrhea. It also disrupts the function of the thyroid gland, which can totally mess with your metabolism and cause weight loss. It also oxidizes when it's hit with UV rays, which the surface of Mars is hit with UV rays all the time, constantly, which means that the soil is not gonna be very good to plant stuff in, no matter how much poop you put in it. Long story short, that famous red dust on the surface of Mars is going to be everywhere, and it's gonna be a problem. Now imagine your body is weakened and your immune system is weakened from being in zero gravity for nine months. You're being constantly bombarded with radiation and cosmic rays. You're eating stuff that comes out of soil that has toxic elements in it. You're drinking your own pee and you're stuck in a really tight, confined space with a dozen or so other people that are in the same situation that you are. And then one person gets sick. After nine months of weightlessness affecting your immune system, your body is very prone to infections. Now it's true that space habitats are extremely clean, but they're not sterile. Throw in all the vomiting and diarrhea and coughing that might be coming from perchlorate exposure and you're bound to shake loose a few body critters that are looking for some action. All it takes is for one colony to take root in one person in that enclosed space and an outbreak is more than a little gonna happen. And then there's just the simple fact that Mars is a dangerous place. There are definitely gonna be some injuries as people just try to get reacclimated to this new type of gravity. Dust storms have been known to encircle the entire planet, which could mess with power generation. All that dust can get into the seals that can affect the airlocks. And something else to keep in mind, in those very long duration ISS missions, they had regular cargo ships resupplying the station with stuff. There will be no cargo ships on a trip to Mars. You have to have everything for the whole 21 month trip there for you. And if something goes wrong, you're on your own. On the ISS and even on the moon, we have almost instantaneous communication. There's a 20 minute gap from Earth to Mars in communication. So if you need to get in touch with Earth for something, you're on your own. And after all of that, you've got to take that nine month trip back home with all the hazards and the perils that I was talking about to get you over there. Only this time it's after spending several months in that death trap called Mars. But let's just say you survive all that and everything goes perfectly and you land back on Earth. 
congratulations, you beat the odds. Every day for the rest of your life is a gift. Yes, schools with your name on them. Yes, media attention galore. And yes, you will probably not be able to hold your head up. In the short term, you can probably expect to be bedridden for a while, expect about a bajillion medical tests to be done on you, and probably a very intense physical therapy regimen. Also expect to be in quarantine for a while. When the Apollo astronauts came back from the moon, they were in quarantine for three months, and there's far less likelihood of there being bacteria on the moon than there are on Mars. And by the way, if there is any bacteria on Mars, it would probably be under the ground, you know, where where you're gonna be living and digging into to protect from the radiation. And we have no idea what that would do to the human body. So yeah, I didn't even mention that earlier. Expect a long period of sensory recovery once you get back into the Earth's gravity, you know, that whole thing of turning your head and the world does somersaults. Long term, obviously your cancer risk has gone way up. Uh, your cognitive abilities might be in decline, but that's probably recoverable. The thing that they're most concerned about though is cardiovascular issues. Today, there are only 24 people who have ever flown outside the safety of the Earth's magnetic shield. Those are obviously the Apollo astronauts that went to the moon. In 2016, a study was published where they looked at the long-term effects of what those astronauts you know, encountered outside of our magnetic shield. They basically compared their results with other astronauts that were in low Earth orbit, as well as other astronauts that, for whatever reason, didn't ever go up into space. They found that the Apollo astronauts had a five times higher likelihood of cardiovascular disease and tests that were run with mice showed the same results. Now why this is happening, they're not entirely sure, but it seems that deep space radiation might mess with endothelial cells, which are the cells that make up the, the lining of the blood vessels, which can apparently lead to clots, that can lead to strokes and heart attacks further on down the line. Also keep in mind that the Apollo astronauts are seeing this much of an effect after only two weeks outside of the Earth's magnetic shield. You, brave Mars explorer, are gonna have that for two years. How much would this affect your cardiovascular system? Could this possibly shorten your life? We really don't know. NASA often talks about the unknown unknowns. Everything I've talked about in this video, the good news is we know about it. We know it exists. We can, we are, we will plan to counter those problems. And if you'd like to know more about those measures, let me know. I, uh, I make videos, you know. It's the unknown unknowns that keep the NASA administrators up at night, the big surprises that come up along the way that we didn't even know were there. And you, brave Mars traveler, will get to discover those things. So why am I being so negative about this? You seem to be saying with that piercing glare you're giving me right now. I can feel it. I can feel it. I'm not trying to be negative. Some of the smartest people in the world are working on solutions to these problems, and I have faith that they're going to find them. It's just, you know, like many of you, I grew up thinking, why the hell haven't we gone to Mars? You know, why didn't we go right after we went to the moon? And it was only after I spent a lot of time with this subject that I realized that going to Mars is just a completely different beast than going to the moon. And there was no way we were technologically mature and ready to make that leap. There was just so much more we had to learn before that. You know, the space station might be boring and it might be routine, but we have learned so much from being up there during all that time. The space station has been occupied for almost 20 years now. That's amazing. And it's only because of all that time and all the experiments and all the people that have done the work up there that we can even consider going to Mars now. We just had the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. And of course there was a lot of videos and content that went out there about it. And I was looking through some of them and there was a thread that I stumbled upon that I started to realize that uh, the Apollo program really shouldn't have happened. It was a product of the Cold War and a need to, you know, best an ideological enemy, and we were not prepared to follow up with that, not technologically, not financially. We rushed to do a thing, and there just wasn't anywhere to go from there. Today, the space industry has matured, technology has evolved, and there's more players in the game, only this time they're being cooperative about it instead of being competitive. The first space race, that was just for show. This space race, the real space race, it's gonna be a hell of a thing to watch. Now, as I said before, there will be no resupply missions to Mars if we get out there. We gotta pack everything that we need for that 21 month journey right at the start. And a really cool documentary that I found that talks specifically about that is called Packing for Mars, which you can watch on CuriosityStream. This documentary, produced in partnership with the ESA, looks at what we could take with us, what would need to go earlier on separate cargo missions to wait for us to get there, and what resources we could utilize on location in Mars. It's an interesting question to ponder, and it's one that we're gonna have to figure out before we go there. This, of course, is just one of many documentaries about Mars specifically, one of hundreds on space and space travel, and one of thousands on all kinds of topics, including nature, futurism, and the arts. 
Curiosity Stream was created by one of the founders of the Discovery Channel, so it's kind of like what the Discovery Channel was meant to be, just high quality brain food that keeps you coming back for more. And because you're awesome, viewers of this channel can get free access to Curiosity Stream for 30 days, and after that, it's only $2.99 a month, which is insane. It's just, it's just such a good deal. You can get that by going to curiositystream.com slash Scott. Now we're all turning to streaming platforms right now to watch all of our content. Uh, Curiosity Stream is definitely one you should add to your list. So curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, links down below. Big thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to my answer files on Patreon, the people who are supporting this channel and helping me build a team. I cannot thank you guys enough. There's some new people. I gotta murder their names real quick. We got uh, Jamie Robinson, Raymond Ng, F Phage Lives, Pepe Lotene Grandes, sure. Uh, Nick Seidenman, Robert Kreischer, Rob Campbell, Ryan Casey, Alex Pollock, Frescura Dan, Scott Holloway, Ross Ward, Bill Marklin, Carl Good, and Ben Edgerly Walsh. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and uh, hang out and get access to exclusive live streams, get access to uh, early uh, access to videos and stuff like that, anyway, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like that one. So click it and see what you think. Uh, there's also plenty of other videos of mine that probably are showing up on your sidebar over here. I invite you to check those out. And if you like them and I earned it, please do subscribe. I come back with Monday videos and Thursday videos every week. And sometimes I say that line right. T-shirts is always available at the store at answerswithjoe.com shirts. If you like something that makes people go, ah -ha -ha! And they're your friend. They're immediately your friend because they got the joke. And that's the kind of shirts that they are available there. There's a whole bunch of them. You can go check them out. Answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. All right. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out now. Have an eye-opening week. And I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.